Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak today on behalf of my employer, DDW The Color House, where I serve as Global Food Science and Regulatory Manager. Let's get a little exercise, please, to start the morning and the afternoon. My time clock's a little off. <laughs> uh, please raise your hand if you have ever worked with uh, trying to replace synthetic colors in your product formula. Okay. And how many of you tried to do so using natural colors? How many using coloring foodstuffs? Okay, not so many. Um, and how many of you tried to formulate a food or beverage for multiple regions of the world? Okay, I bet those of you who raised your hands did not find your task easy. Uh, there is no getting away from the fact that food manufacturers often need to add color to processed food products. The color of food is a surprisingly large part of its appeal and is closely associated with consumer perceptions of flavor and quality. My son loves pineapple and pineapple flavored foods, so I was asking him what he would do if I gave him a red pineapple flavored ice cream. And he told me that he would probably turn it away thinking that I had mistakenly given him strawberry ice cream. And I said, well, you like strawberry and strawberry flavored foods, so what if I gave you the best tasting strawberry flavored ice cream, but it was a bit of a brownish red color? And he explained to me that no, he'd probably still turn it away because he'd think it was yucky. So definitely, as we all know, color plays a large role in consumer perceptions of the foods they're about to eat. The demand for natural colors has outpaced that of synthetics. While synthetic colors are of lower cost and more stable than natural colors, natural colors are on the rise, fueled by consumer concerns over health and improvements in the functionality of natural colors. What are you going to hear today? You're going to hear about the regulatory challenges facing colors. I'm going to speak a little bit to the Southampton study, which you're very all familiar with. A uh, little bit about the challenges that have faced caramel color this last year. The issues related to sensitivity and allergenicity, maybe, of uh, carmine and cochineal extracts. And the next um, challenge facing colors, which is potentially adulteration. We're also going to question whether or not the challenges facing colors are easily avoided by using coloring foodstuffs. And when we decide that that's not the case, and we return to using natural colors, we will question what regulatory considerations we need to take into account when using natural colors, such as the regional approval of the colors uh, in the markets you're trying to uh, develop product for. And we'll talk about the application limitations on the use of those colors and the labeling options, both in the ingredient declaration and the principal display panel, or PDP. The Southampton study. There have been worries about the toxicity of some azo dyes for at least 50 years, and many are no longer approved for use in foods in Europe or are subject to new acceptable daily intakes, or ADIs. As recently as 2007, the EU suspended the use of red dye 2G in response to its breakdown of, uh, to aniline, which is a known carcinogen. The European Food Safety Authority, or EFSA, is currently reviewing the safety of all European food additives. And as a matter of priority, they were asked by the European Commission to review first the Southampton six colors, and then followed by the other colors and other food additives. EFSA has advised the Commission and Parliament to reduce the acceptable daily intakes for three of the colors in question uh, of the Southampton six. The quinoline yellow, the sunset yellow, and Ponso 4R. Although EFSA concluded that the Southampton study did not substantiate a causal link between the hyperactivity and six colors, um, they, there are still consumer concerns over this relationship. The UK Food Standards Agency, or FSA, which funded the Southampton study, still decided that the findings were sufficiently worrying for it to call for a voluntary ban on the use of the Southampton six colors in UK food and drink industry. In 2008, the European Parliament reacted to the findings of the Southampton study by adding to a provision of uh, new food additive regulations, which came into force in 2010, 
the requirement that the synthetic colors in question here, represented here, be identified by the name or the E number, followed by the phrase, may have an adverse effect on activity and attention in children. Uh, at the same time, it should be noted that many in the color industry find the results of the Southampton study to be inconclusive, and an FDA panel recently voted against warning labels for synthetic colors in the USA. However, the panel did call for more studies to determine if there is a link between hyperactivity and these colors. Uh, while not um, an outright ban on the use of these colors or requiring labeling in all these regions, it has certainly encouraged manufacturers to consider replacing these colors, not only in Europe, but in the United States and other countries as well. Caramel color. This year, caramel colors have been under attack because of a chemical known as 4-methylamidazole, or 4-MEI, that is formed in the manufacture specifically of class 3 and 4 caramel colors. On January 7, 2011, based on a technical report by the National Toxicology Program, also known as the NTP, the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or OHIHA, listed 4-methylamidazole as a carcinogen under Prop 65. As a result, a group of plaintiffs filed a lawsuit against OHIHA for what they claimed to be a wrongful listing. However, 4-MEI is ubiquitous in foods, in the food supply, and as a common trace element, uh, commonly created in the natural heat processing of many foods, including roasted coffee, chocolate, baked goods, and class 3 and 4 caramel colors. However, it was still listed on Prop 65, despite all of this use. Caramel class 3 and 4 have been tested for rodent toxicity and have been found not carcinogenic. Furthermore, on March 8, 2011, EFSA released its report that assessed the safety of caramel colors. Based on all available data, including the NTP report that formed the basis of the Forum and Prop 65 listing, uh, the, the EFSA panel concluded that caramel colors are neither genotoxic nor carcinogenic, and there is no evidence of any adverse health effects on human reproduction or the developing child. However, uh, to help those customers that still try to avoid the Prop 65 labeling of their products using class 3 and 4 caramels in California, Dee Dee Williamson now offers multiple low 4 MEI versions of class 3 and 4 caramel colors in both liquid and powder form. In addition, although conventional class 1 caramels do not contain uh, 4-methylamidazole, class 1 caramels are not traditionally stable at low pH. So Dee Dee Williamson has developed a DDW520, which is an acid-proof class 1 caramel color that is stable below pH 2.5. And this is an innovation for the soft drink industry in particular because class 1 caramel is normally only stable down to pH 3.5. This new innovation recently earned the company a finalist position in the beverage innovation category for the Food Ingredients Excellence Award of 2011, which was a competition for integrated innovative ingredients at Food Ingredients Europe. Carmine sensitivity. In January 2011, the US FDA required food companies to label cochineal color or carmine color, instead of the generic term color added, which is permitted by the US FDA regulations. The requirements were reportedly revised in response to severe allergic reactions to these colorings. Canada is considering similar, similar label requirements for cochineal color. Sourced from the ground bodies of the female cochineal beetles, the colorings are used in a variety of products, including Serini ice creams, yogurts, beverages, and candies. Product developers use cochineal extracts when replacing synthetic colors. These natural colorings provide a characteristic pink, red, or purple hue and demonstrate excellent heat and light stability. However, in addition to the issues with sensitivity, cochineal also raises issues for product developers who are interested in kosher, vegan, or vegetarian labels. Over the past few years, all colorings have frequently been in the spotlight. The Southampton study with the, the Southampton 6, EFSA color reviews of the various colors, uh, which are still ongoing, a caramel coloring um, chemical subject to Prop 65, allegations of sensitivity or allogenicity not only against carmine and cochineal, but also against Onato, Codex Committee on Food Additives, or CCFA, color use level reviews, 
just to name a few of the recent regulatory challenges facing colors. Now, concerns are being raised that since natural colors are gaining popularity with improved functionality and stability, they may be at increasing risk for adulteration. Natural food colors have been the target for adulteration through the addition of synthetic colors to raise the apparent quality or the addition of inert materials to increase available quantities through dilution. The United States Pharmacopeia, or USP, has dedicated efforts to modernize the Food Chemical Codex, or FCC, but has faced challenges in developing a method uh, to identify all potential adulterants. Industry is encouraging the USP and other governments to recognize that control of adulteration through improved supply chain relationships and supplier qualifications would be much more successful than trying to develop a monograph to exclude all potential adulterants. This raises a good point. When selecting between natural colors, please make sure that you are comparing apples to apples. Natural colors are a very high value item and individual colors can come in short supply because of crop failure or political issues. Limit availability and high demands lead to high prices which creates an environment for adulteration. The adulteration of natural colors with inexpensive synthetic colors and other dyes may be tempting for the less than ethical suppliers. And this has occurred in the past and undoubtedly will occur in the future. There are cases in Europe where chili powder and paprika were adulterated with Sudan red. Not surprisingly, adulteration of the expensive spice saffron with gardenia yellow has also occurred. And it's your responsibility to know the quality of what you are purchasing and the easiest way for you to do this is to work with an ethical and responsible supplier. So food product developers are increasingly being asked to replace synthetic colors with natural colors. But as we have heard, natural colors can bring a whole new set of problems without necessarily dispensing with all of the old and some now see coloring foodstuffs as the easy answer but we're questioning whether or not it's really that simple. Coloring foods are derived, or supposed to be derived, from recognized foods. They do not require further approval for food use and do not need to be identified by an e-number. An additional selling point of some coloring foodstuffs is that they can deliver not just color, but also health benefits. However, according to the term color as it is used in Regulation 1333-2, 2008, coloring foodstuffs are commonly consumed foodstuffs as such and should be normally used as characteristic ingredients in food. In addition, if a foodstuff is subject to selective extraction, then it should be classified as a color additive. It is, if it is not subject to selective extraction, it can qualify as a coloring foodstuff. A small working group has been set up comprising five EU member countries. Denmark, France, Finland, Sweden, and the UK. This group has been charged with the challenging task of agreeing on a definition for selective extraction. On the 5th of July 2011, during an EP plenary debate on food information to consumers, Commissioner Dali made a commitment that he expected a guidance document defining coloring foods would be available in the second half of 2012. The objective of this expected guidance document is to give official guidance for differentiating food color additives from coloring foods. The document is expected to define the criteria that determines the difference between selective and non-selective extraction for the classification of color additives versus coloring foods. And it plans to do so by a proposed decision tree as well as a checklist which will facilitate this classification. So, are coloring foodstuffs a simple solution to the challenges of synthetic and natural colors? No, there are challenges facing coloring foodstuffs as well. They too lack a globally harmonized definition. And they are often derived from the same sources as natural colors, so they have the same stability problems associated with natural colors, especially in regards to heat and light. Coloring foodstuffs are not selectively extracted for color, so they will contain other components, such as um, flavor carryover, which will cause a haze. Often coloring foodstuffs have to be used at a much higher level than a natural color to have the same effect as the corresponding color additive. And this will compound any flavor contribution or haze. 
So, since there is no perfect solution to replacing synthetic colors, what should you do? Last month, Nielsen conducted an international consumer research survey regarding natural colors. They conducted this survey with 5,000 consumers in 10 different countries, and the responses were 90% answered that they are concerned about synthetic colors. 88% stated that naturally derived colors will add value to foods. And 78 said they're willing to pay a premium for foods that are using naturally derived colors. So it sounds like we've identified what we need to do to meet consumer expectations. We need to replace the synthetic colors with naturally derived ones. So let's explore some of the regulatory challenges of using natural colors. We need to consider the regional approval, the application that we're trying to color, and the labeling options. Regional approvals. There are two principles that current color regulations are really based upon. The additive must not be harmful, and the use of the color additive must not mislead the consumers. However, regulatory bodies across the globe interpret these principles very differently. Thus, the list of approved food colors varies by country. For example, the European Union approves the use of sodium copper chlorophyllin in a broad range of foodstuffs. However, although sodium copper chlorophyllin is an approved food colorant in the USA, its use is presently limited to dry citrus beverages, and it can't be used at levels above 0.2%. In addition, vegetable carbon black is used as a color in Europe and other countries, and it, although at one time it was approved for use in the USA, it's no longer approved. Gardenia yellow is permitted for use in Japan and China, but not in the USA or Europe. Marigold extracts with lutein concentrations as high as 20% are approved for use as dietary supplements in the USA as grass, but not for use as food color additives. In the European Union, lutein preparations are approved food additives, food color additives. In here, you'll find a list of the regulations, which can help you identify which colors are approved in some regions. Uh, there's more information on the Dee Dee Williamson website. Regional limitations on use. Many countries have adopted the approved applications and usage levels posted by Codex, Alimentarius, and color additive specifications published by JECFA. However, other countries independently regulate the use of color additives. As you can see here, the USA, EU, Canada, Japan, and uh, People's Republic of China all specify how colors can be used and which applications, whether or not maximum use levels are, are permitted. Labeling. The customer requirements, either the retailer or the end consumer, should be considered at an early stage to lessen the struggle of identifying what natural color options can be considered for your product. The customer may have religious requirements, such as kosher or halal, or they may have dietary requirements, such as organic, natural, non-GM, vegetarian, or vegan. Let's speak momentarily on the highly sought-after natural claim. Generally, the use of the term natural is not permitted in a product's ingredient list with the exception of the phrase natural flavorings. And there's a few other exceptions that Sebastian identified as well. However, the principal display panel is quite another monster. <clears throat> the principal display panel is regulated in... Um, Various regions, but few global regions, have defined the use of the term natural in relation to food colors. The US FDA currently has no definition for natural, although it is not objected to its use on food PDP labels, principal display panel labels, provided that it is used in a manner that is truthful and not misleading, and the product does not contain added color regardless of source, artificial flavors, or synthetic substances. Warning letters have been issued by the FDA to enforce this policy as it is spelled out in the Federal Register preamble language from 1993. The FDA, however, still might be more willing to accept some natural claims than others as long as you make them as um, non-misleading as possible. One option might be made with naturally derived ingredients, if that's appropriate, as opposed to made with all natural ingredients. Similar to the US FDA informal position, 
The Canadian Guide to Food Labeling and Advertising indicates that a Canadian natural food or natural ingredient of a food is not expected to contain or to have ever contained an added vitamin, mineral, nutrient, artificial flavoring, or food additives such as color. However, unlike the US FDA, the Canadian authorities do acknowledge that some food additives are naturally derived. And they do allow for these ingredients to be regarded as natural ingredients. In addition, Canadian permits foods in which these natural ingredients are used to claim that the food contains natural ingredients or contains only natural ingredients as appropriate. In 2008, the UK Food Standards Agency published a revised criteria for use of the terms fresh, pure, natural, etc. in food labeling. The term natural without qualification should only be used, according to this document, in certain cases, including to describe permitted food additives that are obtained from natural sources by appropriate physical processing, including distillation and solvent extraction, or traditional food preparation processes. This position was further clarified in a 2011 UKFSA guideline on approaches to the replacement of the Southampton Six colors in food and beverages. In the 2011 publication, the UKFSA distinguished between naturally derived colors that are selectively extracted, such as anthocyanins, being the more natural, and those that are selectively extracted and then chemically modified, such as sodium copper chlorophyllin or annatto extracts. Nat Call, the Natural Color Manufacturers Trade Association, is working on an industry definition of natural that is in line with flavor regulations and these other global policies. The definition includes a color classification scheme based on traditional domestic and industrial practices. The working draft was presented at a pre-FIE session, but it still needs to be finalized and approved by members before it will be published on the Nat Call website. Both the Dee Dee Williamson and Nat Call websites have a vast amount of credible information available to you to assist your color learnings. Closing thoughts. What are the take home messages? All in all, it has been a busy, if not somewhat tumultuous year for all food colorings, and I expect the future to continue to be colorful. There's no simple solution to replacing synthetic colors, but consumers are demanding that they be replaced with natural colors. It is your responsibility to work with an ethical and responsible supplier so you can know you're working with safe, quality colors. It's important to identify which countries a product is likely to be sold before you select your colors. It is currently very challenging to have one color formulation that will be globally acceptable. The customer labeling requirements, either the retailer or the end consumer, should be considered at an early stage of your product development to lessen the struggles of identifying what natural color options are available to your project. And utilizing the resources of a quality color supplier will save you time and accelerate you achieving your goals. Considerable energy is expended in the corporate world in attempting to anticipate changes in food color regulations because the possible delisting or ADI reduction of a color based on new or lack of information relating to its safety, toxicity, or allerg allergenicity can induce frustration and anxiety in the workplace. For ease of world trade, harmonization of color regulations would be advantageous, but it's highly unlikely. Thank you. Any questions?